I'm Pastor Brian Paulson, and this is The Message. Thank you for listening here in Libertyville, in Lake County, or all around the world. Center your heart now with the prayer for illumination, listen deeply to Holy Scripture, and get ready for God to deliver a word to you through the message by our associate pastor, the Reverend Amy Heinrich. This is a day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Uh, would you bow your heads with me and join in our prayer of illumination? Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand that understanding we may believe and believing we may follow in all your faithfulness and obedience through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Now, Joel is in the Old Testament and is one of the minor prophets, and this refers to a change of your hearts, this reading. It starts with, Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your hearts, with fasting, with weeping and sorrow. Carry your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, very patient, full of faithful love, ready to forgive. This is the end of our first reading of scripture today. May God put this reading to our use. Our second scripture reading today comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Now, it begins with, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. He sat down and his disciples came to him. He taught them saying, blessed are the people who are hopeless because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are the people who grieve because they will be made glad. Blessed are the people who are humble, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, because they will be fed until they are full. Blessed are the people who show mercy, because they will receive mercy. Blessed are the people who have pure hearts, because they will seek God. Blessed are the people who make peace because they will be called God's children. Blessed are the people whose lives are harassed because they are righteous, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And blessed are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you, all because of me. Be full of joy and be glad because you have a great reward in heaven. In the same way the people harassed the prophets who came before you. This is the end of our reading from Scripture today. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In this Lenten season, the prophet Joel calls us to rend or tear open our hearts. We are called to let them break to crack open, to let them fall apart so that we can see into their hidden chambers, the hidden spaces where we have been hesitant to go. Your entire life is there, inscribed in the walls of your heart. Every path taken or left behind, every face you turn toward or away from, every word spoken in love or in rage, every aspect of your life you would rather leave in the shadows, the treasures found, and those yet to be discovered, the misperceptions and the wisdom waiting to be revealed. No wonder Lent gives us 40 days to wander around in the wilderness of our hearts, not long enough. May this be a welcome season of wandering and wondering. May we trust the breaking that can ultimately bring the blessing. 
May we trust the rupture that eventually brings the return to the one who waits and works with the rending to make our hearts whole, new, and living. God is waiting not to judge us, but to bless us. God is waiting to bestow blessings of the Beatitudes that we will not understand unless our hearts are broken open and our consciousness is elevated to their deeper meaning. If we try and understand the Beatitudes with our heads and not our hearts, they will completely elude us. If we try to understand them by our linear causality, the rules of this world, they won't add up. They won't make sense. Rationally, from the presuppositions of our world, there is a trap hidden in the Beatitudes that I have fallen into numerous times, and perhaps you have as well. The trap is subtle. It is the belief that Jesus is setting up the conditions of blessing rather than actually blessing his hearers then and now. After all, we normally don't receive affirmations before we've earned them, right? The world we live in and are so familiar with is an if-then kind of world. If you work hard, then you will reap the reward. It is the world of natural consequences for our decisions. We live in a competitive, conditional meritocracy that has been reinforced through our educational and our economic systems. Are you with me? So when we hear the Beatitudes, it's difficult not to hear Jesus as stating the terms under which we might get blessed. If and only if we really strive to emulate the spiritually mature who have purity of heart and the magnanimity of character combined with the real skills to do what it takes to make peace, then we'll be blessed. When we hear, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, I have thought, rats, looks like I won't be seeing God because my heart isn't pure. It's full of mixed motives and conflicting values. On good days, when I actually manage to do something noble, I am still tainted with self-interested motives. Or when I hear, blessed are the peacemakers, I think of all the ways I fall short from doing the hard work of being a peacemaker, even in my own family, my church, my community, my world. I feel admonished and often guilty, at least with blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I have the reassurance that when I inevitably grieve, and who among us doesn't suffer lamentable losses, I will be comforted. But to be perfectly honest, pun intended, that's not much comfort. Because the truth is, I don't want to mourn. And hearing the Beatitudes doesn't make it much e easier, easier and doesn't make me more eager. You have to be a masochist to say, bring on the grieving. Bring on the persecution. Can you relate to my reaction? I began to wonder whether our our difficulty with the Beatitudes is symptomatic of a larger problem most of us have. Namely, we feel unworthy of God's blessings. We feel we have to do something to deserve it. Perhaps we have a hard time believing that God wants to bless us in the first place. Or maybe that we have a distorted image of God as a judge 
a lawgiver. And so it seems out of character of God to want to bless us without requirements. Yes, there is a tension in Scripture between God's judgment and God's mercy. But as I read the Bible, God's character leans strongly toward grace, forgiveness, and love. God initiates covenantal relationship with us and never, ever gives up on us. This is why we say in our baptismal lit litany, we love because God loves us first. This is sheer blessing, gratuitous. However, even if we do accept God's unconditional love, our hang-up can be that we know ourselves so well as to feel unworthy of such lavish grace. We are all too familiar with our own faults and limitations, our insecurities and our failures. And knowing that God knows all about this and more, we simply can't imagine that God wants to hug us into becoming. We're so used to paying for our mistakes, paving our own way, towing the line, and reaping the consequences if we don't. It's unsettling and even inconceivable to imagine that God acts differently. But our God does. It is not that God is letting us off the hook and say, I don't care what you do. Your life is your own. You can become whatever you want. Quite to the contrary, the vision Jesus lays out for us in his Sermon on the Mount is far loftier and more rigorous and challenging than any goal we could ever set for ourselves. So then, has Jesus created a utopian fantasy? Standards that no human being could live up to? I think not. The critical question is, how do we become the ones who stand in solidarity with the poor, who mourn not only for our own losses, but the losses of our neighbors, who are nonviolent and gentle, who hunger and thirst for the common good and are never satisfied with the status quo? who are merciful and compassionate, who are known for their sincere motives, who work for peace and understanding in a world full of divisions, who keep standing up for justice even when we are put down and misunderstood for it, who speak and act with courage of their own God-given convictions as the prophets did, even when we might be ridiculed, misinterpreted, threatened, harmed, persecuted. Jesus wants us to be those people, but God has a different way of empowering us and cajoling us on this path of becoming. I love this story as a way to understand what I'm talking about. When theologian David Luce was in graduate school, one of his teachers, Dr. Cleophus LaRue, would regularly address him as Dr. Luce. Eventually, it made him uncomfortable enough that he said to him, but Dr. LaRue, I haven't earned my doctorate yet. I don't think you should be calling me doctor. Dr. Luce, Dr. LaRue patiently responded, in the African-American church, we are not content to call you what you, my, what you are, but instead call you what you believe we believe you will be. Let me say that again. In the African-American church, we are not content to call you what you are, 
but instead we call you what we believe you will become. Friends, we become what we are called, and Jesus is calling us blessed to affirm that we are capable of becoming the people described in the Beatitudes. And when we find ourselves actually being humbled, making peace, showing mercy, grieving with a friend, standing with the poor and the oppressed, standing up for what is right, we will receive an even greater blessing. God will whisper into the depths of our heart, well done, good and faithful servant. With you, I am well pleased. When we are given the message, I love you, I believe in you, then we have the self-esteem and confidence to dream and to do far more than we ever thought possible. Then we are not crippled with low self-image, guilt, and shame. When we know ourselves to be deeply loved, accepted, and blessed just as we are, then we are set free from the slavery of doing, striving, climbing, constantly having to prove our worth all the time. Then we can rest in God's grace and just be. This transforms our attitudes about everything, about God, ourselves, one another, how transformation actually happens. We are blessed into becoming who God created us to be. As we shift our mode of being, we can see with the eyes of our hearts into another realm of possibility and it's sheer grace. Jesus reminds us that although we are in this world, we are not to be of this world. God's ways are not our ways. And from this higher, holier plane of consciousness, our attitudes, our perceptions change. With hearts broken open, the secret truth hidden in the Beatitudes is in the name, Be Attitudes. In the Middle Ages, when somebody sneezed, you said, God bless you, fearing that they may have the plague. This mantra, which we repeat regularly, has developed as a way to ward off evil, disease, and death. But we can reclaim those three powerful words to represent not fear, but faith, not disease, but delight, not death, but God's new life. As we do, perhaps we reclaim not only the be attitudes, but the insight that God delights to create, bless, redeem, and remind us that we are God's beloved, and we are blessed to become who God created us and calls us to be. We become what we are called. So, I invite you to turn to a person near you and bless each other. Call the person by name and then say to them, blessed are you to become who God created you to be. Blessed are you to become who God created you to be. Blessed are you to become who God created you to be. Thank you for listening on our podcast, 
or through our YouTube playlist of sermons, be sure to forward this message to someone who you believe is seeking God's word today.